Thanks very much, Sandra. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, Jeff uh, introduced, Jeff Babham introduced Jack Stat Sigling as, uh, with an AFL analogy, and I thought I would raise the tone a little bit and have a, a sort of uh, real uh, classic uh, uh, theme here. And of course, what, what, it is long, and, but it contains everything. And I think that the TNF signaling really does contain any, everything. So the disclaimer is that I really can't cover it all. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that I think are interesting. And, and honestly, if you go away and are inspired to read, then are uh, on the subject a bit deeper, then I will feel that I've done my job. Um, <clears throat> and um, I do use a lot of my own reviews and work, and the only thing that you should take home from that is I'm a little bit lazy, and it was a lot easier to grab my own uh, work. Uh, I certainly th I'm not the only person working in this field. So uh, this is uh, <coughs> Harvey Lodish, a fifth edition, published in 2004. And you can see that they, uh, this is a textbook that they definitely got in La Trobe University. I don't know if you get it in Melbourne University. But you can see that the, the major classes of cell surface signaling receptors are, are listed. And you'll notice that TNF is not there. So that would be my first lesson to students, is that just because it's in the textbook doesn't really <laughs> make it, uh, make it uh, right. Um, and of course, I'm going to tell you how amazingly important TNF signaling is, and it is a little bit humbling to realize that you can write a whole, uh, this is longer than War and Peace, a whole, whole textbook, uh, and never mention, uh, you know, this major, major class of uh, TNF um, signaling receptors. Uh, so I wanted to write fail here, but I, I guess they, they did get seven out of eight, and I don't want to put the students off. Seven out of eight is still a pass. So... Uh, <laughs> They got it right in 2007, and of course, it, it really is one of the major classes of cell signaling receptors, and we have learned so much about signaling from the extracellular, uh, from outside the cell into inside the cell. And in particular, as we'll see, uh, I think that ubiquitin uh, plays a, a critical role in this signaling pathway. And uh, in fact, studies of the TNF signaling pathway have led to many insights into the way that ubiquitin regulates uh, signaling pathways. So <clears throat> some basics, TNF is, uh, forms a trimer, uh, and its receptors also form trimer, trimers. <clears throat> now, a lot of people use uh, the uh, term, terminology TNF-alpha. I just prefer to use TNF because there is not a TNF beta. TNF beta was a name that was coined apparently by, by Genentech, but it was some sort of ev evil corporate thing where they wanted to have some sort of patenting rights. So there is no lymphotox, uh, there is no TNF beta, it's just lymphotoxin alpha. And so I'm just going to stick to the name lymphotoxin. And the key thing is if you have too much of it, you're going to feel unwell. Um, and you may die. And you'll get uh, this uh, syndrome uh, like a, a cytokine storm and an endotoxic shock. This is shown quite nicely in this paper from Peter van den Arbele's group, where they just uh, uh, inject mice uh, with, with TNF. And you can see that they are uh, just measuring the core body temperature. Uh, uh, they rapidly uh, lose that body temperature, and you can see there's a, this very nice dose-dependent effect. I'm not going to really go into the protection here, but uh, we, we might touch on it later, where uh, a RIP3 knockout is protected from this uh, lethal loss in, in uh, core body temperature. So the, the talk is going to be outlined where I just discuss a little bit of the history, the, the family of uh, TNF the TNF superfamily, a little bit on the evolution because I, I think it's quite interesting. Inflammatory diseases, pathways, which is one of my key areas of interest, and a little bit at, at the end about uh, just, just to set the record straight about what TNF is really doing because we might imagine from um, looking at this that the role of TNF is to cause diseases uh, and really it's there to, to help us uh, resist bacterial and, and viral infections. So the history. Uh, it's got a long and proud history. Um, <clears throat> as a German physician who uh, reported the regression of tumors in 
humans after a bacterial infection. And then uh, this guy, Coley, comes on the scene. He's an American oncologist. In actual fact, there's a really nice little story here, was that in 1898, when he started as, as a medic, he was uh, called in to treat a 17-year-old woman who had this uh, type of sarcoma on her hand. And um, it turns out that she was a, a very big friend of um, uh, John D. Rockefeller that led, and her death, because Coley was unable to, to, to treat her sarcoma, uh, led to the, uh, was the inspiration for the philanthrop philanthropic work and, and the foundation of the Rockefeller Institute of Medical Research. So her death really affected uh, William Coley. And so he went away and looked in the literature and he found this report that uh, had uh, described where this uh, man had had a, a bacterial infection and had uh, been able to recover from, from his uh, cancer and of course, that wasn't such an unusual thing to happen in those days. If you had a, a, a surgery in those days to remove a tumor, you might well get a, a bacterial infection on the top of it. So, inspired, so, so he actually went and found this guy who, who, uh, who had recovered from his uh, sarcoma and found him still alive. And so he was inspired to uh, take uh, extracts uh, from, from bacteria and inject it into the tumor and kill it. A couple of key uh, uh, milestones along the way, where uh, <coughs> Sheridan showed that, uh, that the, the, the key active ingredient in that bacterial extract uh, that was able to induce the tumor necrosis um, was LPS. And, and uh, another key result was uh, the group of O'Malley in, in 62, who showed that it, the LPS wasn't directly uh, killing the tumor, it was actually inducing. Uh, inducing the production of something that would then go on to kill the tumor. And the way, they did, the way that that group did that was they just took the, the plasma from uh, the serum from, from these uh, mice and showed that the serum could transfer that protective activity. And, and this is one of uh, uh, Coley's patients that was uh, apparently treated. It was kind of controversial uh, because he, he wasn't really a fantastic scientist and he didn't record things super well. But anyway, it was enough to, to get the field going. And you can see that uh, it led to, to some uh, progress. And, and the ultimate um, purification and sequencing of TNF. So, but it turns out that when you, tr you know, there was great hope that we would be able to use this recombinant TNF to treat tumors exactly as uh, Coley had done. But, but of course, what it did was induce massive systemic toxicity. Uh, you get fevers, headaches, rigors, hypertension, and pulmonary edema. Uh, basically, the, the, uh, the, me the, the membrane gets permeabilized, and you get leakage of a lot of liquid uh, fr uh, from, the, from the gut and, and into the uh, uh, lungs that, that are causing that, that sort of uh, lethal effect. Now, it turns out that probably... The uh, tumor vasculate, why was, it, why was the Coley's uh, uh, toxins uh, effective? And they're very only effective in a particular types of, uh, of cancers. Uh, it turns out that the, the vasculature, vasculature of tumors is, is not as uh, organized and, and uh, robust as a normal healthy endothelial lining. So it's already sensitive to uh, disruption. And secondly, it appears to express uh, a large amount of, t it appears to express a larger amount of TNF receptor uh, than, than the uh, healthy endothelial lining. So uh, when, when it gets treated with TNF, it gets permeabilized, and, th and this uh, obviously disrupted the tumor. So you can't use TNF on its own to uh, treat tumors. Uh, but you can, in, in very special cases, where you can perform an isolated uh, limb uh, perfusion, so basically change the circulation and inject uh, TNF so that it doesn't get into, into the body. And this has, has been used quite successfully in Europe, and particularly in tumors that are this sort of uh, sarcoma origin. Uh, and when it's combined with a, um, with a chemotherapy, methphalan, uh, this allows that, that uh, chemotherapy therapy to sort of penetrate into the uh, tumor 
uh, and and kill it better. And it was really again. This is like to just show a little bit of evidence uh, that it's the uh, it, it's not the tumor itself that is being killed by the TNF, but it's rather the, the vasculature that is being attacked. And what you can see here is uh, if it took this uh, particular uh, sarcoma and, and uh, treated it with uh, in, in mice and treated it with TNF. You, you managed to get tumor necrosis. And if you then took the TNF receptor 1 knockout tumor and treated it with TNF, you still got that uh, a tumor necrosis. However, if you took a, uh, put the tumor into a, a wild type mouse, you got tumor necrosis. But if you put it into a P55 knockout mouse, then you could no longer get that necrosis of the tumor. So TNF. Tumor necrosis factor is not actually uh, hitting the tumor at all. It's hitting the, the tumor of vasculature. <clears throat> so it's already a, a little bit of a misnomer, and, and maybe it should actually be called tumor promoting factor. This is work from uh, this is a review from Francis Balkville, who, Balkville, who, who has uh, sort of led the area of TN, uh, the field of TNF being actually tumor promoting. And, and this uh, slide shows very nicely the two uh, effects of, of TNF. So here you can see that the uh, tumor is uh, looking good. And then intratumoral injection of TNF causes this necrosis and, and death of the tumor through that, through that vasculature. However, and it was quite surprising at the time when Francis's group took a TNF knockout and treated it with a, a carcinogen, DMBA, T and TPA. Uh, as, as had previously been reported, these mice uh, developed these uh, uh, tumors. However, when she did that into the TNF knockout mice, that they didn't get the, the tumors. Um, and this, uh, this sort of observation, and there were, there were several in, in mice, led to the idea that we could maybe actually inhibit tumor growth using uh, anti-TNF antibodies. And um, I found a couple of these uh, early clinical trials that where, where Francis is, is on, um, where they were showing sort of encouraging effects, and particularly in ovarian cancer, which tends to be a type of tumor that uh, overexpresses TNF uh, naturally. Uh, and, and we're showing sort of encouraging effects. But I've not been able to follow up uh, to, to see how well those uh, trials have been progressing. So I think that it's an interesting idea that you can target uh, a TNF. But I, I don't really know what, what the actual outcome is. And, and some of these were in, in 2005. I, I would have expected to see a little bit more uh, success if, if, if it was going to work, a few more uh, publications. But uh, you know, I think this really that these sort of observations uh, got the uh, ball rolling in in understanding that uh, inflammation may actually be a, a, a driver of uh, tumorigenesis, and we're all very familiar with uh, the work of uh, the, with this particular uh, review from Hanahan and, and Weinberg, where they defined uh, six characteristics that all tumors uh, should, should attain. Uh, in order to, to grow and, and, and to kill uh, patients. Um, and, and this is a, an update of, of that uh, initial uh, review where they identified uh, enabling characteristics. These are not hallmarks of tumors. These are enabling characteristics where inflammation, uh, it's gonna, as we've discussed and discussing, TNF is a major driver of inflammation. Uh, this enables the tumor to grow. Um, and, and the evidence that inflammation uh, drives tumor growth is, is actually uh, very strong. People that suffer from inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis have an increased propensity uh, to, to, generate, uh, to, to generate tumors and, and, and to succumb to cancer. And so, that, so that's quite well established. And uh, secondly, there's a very strong evidence now that uh, anti-inflammatory drugs will in, uh, reduce the risk of developing certain cancers, uh, and such as uh, colon uh, uh, cancer and breast cancer. 
And this uh, news article in Science in, in 2012 um, really you know, is making the point now that uh, even though aspirin in itself is not the perfect drug because it induces intestinal bleeding and, and other things, at low doses it may actually be a, a wonder drug uh, that could be used to, uh, to limit inflammation. Uh, and again, that's really limiting uh, the role of, of TNF. And I was quite surprised to read here that in actual fact the, the, the first evidence that um, that aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs could reduce the risk of cancer actually came from a study that was uh, performed in Melbourne um, uh, in the 70s, Gabriel Kuhn. I even looked him up on the, on the internet, and uh, as you do, I stalked him. I can't find a single picture of him, so even though he's next door, um, he's obviously a very, very uh, private person. Right. <clears throat> so, so why should uh, inflammation uh, lead to cancer? Again, the, the, there are people had already noted, and, and this is a, a landmark paper from Dvorak, who, who, who put forward the hypothesis that uh, you know, epith uh, tumors, uh, epithelial cancers, are wounds that do not heal. They're stimulating. Uh, uh, an inflammatory environment, they're recruiting um, macrophages and, and neutrophils in there. And, and this, uh, this continuous response uh, can, but Dvorak pro proposed that, that this would lead to, to the uh, growth and development of the tumor. Um, so, but, but really, that, that was really just a hypothesis. And, and, but if you think about it, it, it really makes a lot of sense. If, if TNF is there promoting inflammation to, to help uh, protect us uh, in, in a wounding situation, it's going to supply a lot of molecules to the, the tumor, uh, including growth factors, survival factors. So, so we're hitting all these hallmarks here where we're supplying, supplying growth factors, uh, we are survival factors to help uh, cells uh, resist the, the stress. And the, the other major thing, of course, it's doing is uh, breaking down the extracellular matrix and facilitating angiogenesis, invasion, and metastasis. So this, this as part of the natural process of dealing with a wound, it, it's actually doing a lot of things that uh, tumors want to do. And an example here is provided with the CXCR4 uh, and CXCL2 ligand to that receptor. And uh, they are upregulated, particularly in ovarian cancer cells. And, and this would promote the, 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 the movement of the, the tumor. And the, the other thing that, that it may do, and uh, again, I'm not uh, extremely, um, I, I think this, this type of uh, explanation makes a lot of intrinsic sense. It, it, there's also some evidence, and I'm not really sure how strong it is, and that, that's why I'm going to put it as a, a caveat, that the, the, the chemicals that are released is, is part of this inflammatory environment, the reactive oxygen species, may contribute to, to genome instability and, and the development of the tumor. So... That, that's a, a sort of the history. TNF was named because it would kill tumors, but of course it turns out that it may actually play a role in promoting uh, tumor growth. So let, let's meet the, the family. And TNF is, is really the big daddy of the family, although we've got uh, these uh, uh, ligands here that all show, share homology with the TNF homology domain, all forming uh, these trimers. The most potent uh, activities are really driven uh, by TNF. Now, TNF binds to its receptors TNFR2 and TNFR1. And as I'm going to explain very quickly, I'm going to focus on, on TNFR1 signaling. Um, just little uh, things to point out. This is a cysteine-rich domain, a repeated cysteine-rich domain that, that uh, is the a defining feature of the receptors here. And TNFR1 contains this uh, death domain, which uh, we're going to discuss in more detail in, in a few more minutes. Uh, 
Um, the reason that I'm going to focus on TNFR1 is very, very clear. If, you, if, you want it, if you're interested in, in following up on TNF Receptor 2, this was a quite nice review from uh, Miriam Davis and, and Denise Faustman. Um, this, the very simple reason to focus on TNFR1 is that uh, nearly all cells of the body express TNFR1 and respond to it, whereas TNFR2, it, it's got a quite a decent expression in, in a number of cell types, but, but it's definitely not uh, th throughout the body. And, and to be honest, my focus on TNFR1 matches the focus in, in the literature. Uh, this is a much more studied uh, part of, of TNF signaling. So just a very quick bit about evolution. And of course, evolu uh, history uh, is recounted by the winners. This is uh, Hercules uh, beating the lion, the famous uh, Aesop's uh, fable. And uh, fish, fishes of, fish have got uh, TNF uh, ligands, TNF alpha. These are uh, Danio rerio and, and carps and, and salmon. They can have TNF. Bees do it. Well, I don't know if actually if bees do it, but I do know that flies do it, so that was good enough for me. And uh, even corals in the seas do it, okay? Uh, of course, you're lucky I didn't sing that, but anyway. Um, this paper came out last week, and I, I was really quite uh, fascinated with it. It's showing that even in coral, there's, there's a large number of these TNF uh, uh, ligands and, and, and receptors, uh, 40 receptors and 13 uh, ligands. So this family really goes way back in, in evolution. And actually, it's quite interesting because in the flies, there's only the, the TNF, uh, Iger, and, and Wengen. Uh, so so way back, going further back in evolution, there's actually more of these TNF ligands. And what they did in, in this paper uh, was they actually treated corals with uh, human TNF and could show that it induced uh, apoptotic blebbing and cell death and, and even coral bleaching. So I don't know if uh, corals are being bleached because of TNF, but it's, a, it's an interesting idea. And uh, while I was looking this up, obviously this, the, the title is a reference to, to Cole Porter, uh, the Let's Do It, Let's Fall in Love song. And I, I found this little snippet, and anyone that knows me knows that I've got to go off on little uh, digressions uh, whenever, <laughs> whenever the fancy takes me. And I hadn't realized that Italian nobility was such a, a bad thing, <laughs> because uh, obviously it ranks up there with uh, cross-dressing and a large supply of uh, re recreational drugs. There we go. And even, let's go further back in evolution, this, this critter here, a Cnidaria, if I've pronounced it correctly, uh, has uh, TNF family members. So TNF, it's been winning for the last 700 million years. It's obviously a very important uh, cytokine. I just want to point out a little bit about the, the chromosomal organization. Uh, TNF uh, is very closely linked to uh, lymphotoxin alpha and lymphotoxin beta. And you're going to hear from, if you turn up to uh, Nima's uh, seminar later this afternoon, which I strongly uh, endorse and, and recommend, uh, lymphotoxin alpha and TNF are, are very uh, similar uh, cytokines, and uh, they're, they're very uh, closely linked. And you can see that that uh, linkage is conserved in, in all, all these mammals. And, and uh, TNF uh, and, and the lymphotoxins are embedded into this much larger MHC class locus. And I think this is, again, a very strong indication that uh, TNF is playing an absolutely fundamental, pivotal role in, in the immune uh, system. So, inflammatory diseases. Um, this character here. Uh, Mark Feldman, do you know where he did his PhD? You know, in the Weehai, <laughs> he did his bit. Lynn's shaking, uh, nodding. Did you work with him? Ah, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> that was close, was it? Mark Feldman did his PhD with Goss Nossel, I, I, uh, as far as I can gather from, uh, the, from uh, reading up about him. 
Um, and, but, but in actual fact, his work showing that TNF was really important in uh, inflammatory diseases, and in particular rheumatoid arthritis, was actually done uh, in the UK. But, but he is Australian, and he just went to, went to the UK to, to do his work. So we've already uh, seen uh, the beginnings of this timeline where TNF was cloned in 1984, and in fact, uh, Mark's group showed that, you know, it was understood that rheumatoid arthritis was, there were a lot of inflammatory cytokines uh, it, it, there uh, dr driving the disease. Uh, and it, it, David Wallach's group uh, generated uh, an anti-TNF antibody, and uh, uh, some companies generated the anti-TNF antibody, and Mark's group got, got hold of that. And they just looked at uh, synovial um, uh, tissue from these uh, synovial cell culture systems and showed that the anti-TNF antibody uh, blocked IL-1, which is, a, of course, the other major inflammatory uh, cytokine. And you know, very quickly, this led to the, the development uh, or, or to testing the uh, anti-TNF antibody in a rheumatoid arthritis patients. I think this is the beauty of this time is that when you had only one or two targets, and this one already looked to be a very good target because it was hitting the other one, then you could go straight into a clinical trial and feel quite good about it. Whereas, of course, now the more that we know, it becomes less, off, less obvious that, that you would try particular things. But I do want to make another point here, is that um, this was an immensely successful uh, clinical trial because it really was hitting the target. And so, within 10 years... Uh, anti-TNF therapeutics and fliximab and, and Tanacept, which I, I'm going to go into, uh, were already uh, effectively treating a quarter of a million patients. And I think there's a lesson there for people that are, like myself that are working with anti-cancer drugs, uh, and, and often they're not progressing so fast because they're not as effective. This is really a wonder drug. If you get it right, you will have fantastic clinical effects that will be taken up uh, very quickly by, by clinicians. And, you know, it's, it has, the anti-TNF drugs have transformed the treatment of, of these diseases. And uh, if you just look at the amount of money that is being generated by these drugs, that's one indication of how effective they are. So the top three best-selling drugs in the world are anti-TNF reagents. And that, those projected sales of 30, combined almost 30 billion, they were actually uh, topped. And, and this is the, the structure of, of etanercept. So etanercept is a, one of the P75, the TNFR2 receptor. It's the, the soluble part. Uh, and that's fused to the FC region of human IgG. And uh, it's, it's remarkably stable. And uh, you give it to patients uh, and... and Ian's here, I think, as well, wasn't he? Yep. Uh, certainly, if you talk to people like Ian Wicks that, that use it, uh, uh, the, these drugs, you really appreciate how, how powerful they are. Infliximab is a, is a monoclonal that, that targets TNF. This is slightly more effective than if infliximab, and that may be something to do with uh, the ability of this to, to target uh, lymphotoxins as well as uh, TNF. Uh, and uh, I said that th it really works very well in, in rheumatoid arthritis. It works fantastically well in psoriasis. And uh, again, you can see here that he's a patient. And within uh, 12 weeks, uh, th this patient would be feeling uh, a whole lot better. And I have a personal... Uh, the cont uh, pers I know somebody personally who, who went on these uh, TNF inhibitor drugs and he said, John, they are unbelievable. You know, I was feeling terrible, I was feeling rubbish, and I knew that these drugs work. I expected them to work. But I didn't expect that within 24 hours I would start to feel a whole lot better. So they really are uh, working ex extraordinarily well. And, uh, you know, the mice will be pleased to hear that we can see, uh, see similar uh, effects uh, in, in, in the lab. Uh, this is a mouse that I'm going to discuss, and I do discuss a lot 
Uh, this mouse fails to regulate TNF signaling properly. And as a result, even though it's born looking perfectly normal, uh, and, and for three or four weeks it, it's going along uh, fine, but it starts to succumb to uh, these lesions which grow progressively worse. And this is exactly what we expect from this uh, master inflammatory cytokine. If it gets out of control, it keeps driving uh, uh, disease. And here you can see this sort of very horrible uh, psoriatic type disease. Um, and yet if we cross that mouse to uh, a, a TNF knockout and simply remove one allele of TNF, that mouse is really phenomenally well protected. And you, you could imagine that's the sort of effect that we've that seen in the clinic where you don't hit all of the TNF signaling. Uh, there's no drug that's that good. Here, just removing half is able to survive, uh, pro provide a very significant protection. So I, I thought th this was an interesting, um, it shouldn't, yeah. The interesting little little snippet here about uh, auto-inflammatory diseases, and I liked it because uh, well, it, it's quite a well-known piece of work, uh, showing that uh, uh, patients that suffer from a uh, periodic inflammatory uh, syndrome had mutations in the TNFR1. And the hypothesis that they put forward was that, uh, as you can see here, that the patients express a lot of TNF on the on the Cell surface of the uh, peripheral mono uh, of the blood cells and, and, and the monocytes, and their idea was that uh, this the the cell surface receptor wasn't being cleared properly or wasn't being uh, uh, cleaved by by metalloproteases, and that this wasn't releasing a, a decoy-like receptor like etanercept, like like the the drug. So so that's the similarity here. But um, again, uh, I think that this, the, the rationale for why these patients uh, suffer from an inflammatory disease is, is not quite uh, as they have said. Um, and I wanted to look up this particular work, but I wasn't able to access it, where it really says that now uh, this TN traps uh, type TNFR1-associated periodic syndromes are treated with IL-1 antagonists. So remember, IL-1 would be downstream of TNF. I think to me this suggests that, in actual fact, this is uh, continuously signaling, and this is what's uh, causing the inflammation. So again, now I'm going to get on to the, to the meat of, of my talk, if you like, the, the nuts and bolts of what, what I really work on. Um, and that's how TNF signals through TNFR1. And I appreciate that I could have presented this in slightly different ways. I'm kind of expecting you to have some sort of knowledge of the receptor and the, the ligand. But honestly, in the history of it, we, we knew that there was the ligand and then the receptor. So I figured if we could work it out historically, we, we can work it out uh, in, in this 40-odd uh, minutes. So hopefully there'll be some light to see of... of uh, some of the things that I've already uh, described to you. So, uh, as I said, uh, if you go away and read something, uh, I'll, be, I'll be pleased. Um, really, and this is my war and peace analogy as well, is that understanding TNFX signaling is incredibly uh, complex. And uh, the Genentech group have described um, the... Uh, the, the, the number of players that regulate TNF signaling is an embarrassment of riches. I think that it's uh, more like a, a web constructed by a drug-addled spider. And that's the actual reference. And this one's on amphetamines. And this one's on LSD, which is apparently, in spiders, this is more accurate than that one, except for missing segments. So that was where he was in the field and just sort of lost his mind. So because it is incredibly complicated, I'll try and give you the simple view um, first. Really, it, 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 we can break it down to something very simple. We have the TNF binding to, to the receptor, uh, and the, as I've said, TNFR1. And this recruits a platform. And this platform gets ubiquitinated. And this ubiquitin platform provides uh, another platform to recruit and activate kinases. 
Now, because uh, the ubiquitin platform is important for the recruitment and activation of the kinases, you can have deubiquitylating enzymes that remove the ubiquitin and prevent the activation uh, of, of kinases. This uh, platform, th this signaling pathway in addition to uh, resulting in activation of the transcription factors, NF-kappa-B and, uh, and uh, the MAP kinases and, and the AP1 and, and junk uh, transcription factors, which will drive inflammatory cytokine production. Also, and, and this is uh, you know, a little bit of the interesting part of uh, TNF receptor signaling, is it also simultaneously drives a secondary signaling complex that can drive uh, cell death. And I'm going to discuss that in, in more detail in a minute. So this is the spider's web. If, you, you know, if we go away from that very simple picture, and you can see that uh, here's our platform. Uh, it's got a, a number of components. And here's the ubiquitylating enzymes, the CIPs that ubiquitylate and then recruit and activate uh, these uh, kinases. The kinases phosphorylate the inhibitor of NF-kappa-B, and I'm not going to go into detail here because you heard all of this from um, Lorraine, uh, the degradation of IKB uh, and the translocation of uh, P65 into the nucleus, uh, P50, P65. And one of the first targets of that TNF signaling Again, remember that it's such a potent, dangerous cytokine. One of the first targets is its own inhibitor. So the IKB gets produced and immediately tries to, to shut the pathway down. So because it is complex, um, I should have plugged this in. Uh, I, I do try a number of different ways to try and understand uh, how this signaling complex works. So. We've got our receptor here, and we get the ubiquitylation of RIP uh, that recruits NEMO and IKK, phosphorylates uh, IKB alpha, and translocation of P65 into the nucleus. I really had high hopes for, for that uh, method because I really wanted to understand it at the sort of 3D level, uh, but I cannot tell you how painstaking uh, <laughs> to produce that video was. So I gave that up. And now I tried something else. And I, I, I think there is a lot of future in this. And we've seen, um, uh, seen Drew Barry's uh, stunning work. Unfortunately, Drew is very busy. So I had to get uh, Vincent Rowe to help me. And here you can see the trimeric TNF binding the receptor, recruiting this uh, complex that contains RIP in black and TRAD in, in green. And then these are the IAPs, and they're going to ubiquitylate RIP1. Um, now, this looks fantastic, uh, but you know, it is nice, nice to show. And it's as structurally accurate as we can make it, as, as uh, Vincent and I can make it. These are actual crystal structures of the proteins. But I still think there's something very there's still very much Hollywood about it because we really don't know what happens. We can, I hope, to understand these uh, pathways by, by trying this type of exercise, but, but it's still a model, and that what should be uh, really understood. And, and the money ran out, as it often does in, in Hollywood, and so we have to go back to this sort of schematic uh, representation, this boring schematic representation. Here we've got RIP being ubiquitylated, recruiting these kinases, la, 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 producing the inflammatory cytokines. But, and, and this is an, a big message that I want to get across, is that you, know, you can draw these models and they look perfect and they're structurally accurate, but you look in the cell and you see something quite different. So first, the good news. If you take a trad knockout MEF, and here you can see, we can see some of these markers. Degradation of IKB. We treat it with TNF. Uh, we see the degradation. We see the phosphorylation of IKB alpha. We see phosphorylation of these uh, downstream kinases, junk, ERK, P38. And if we look in MEFs, uh, mouse embryonic fibroblasts, we lose that signaling. So that tells us that that model looks pretty good. There's uh, TRAD, and it's recruiting uh, everything. However, if you look in macrophages, 
what you see is that trad knockout macrophages are actually signaling uh, very well. They're signaling most of those things. This clearly tells us that however nice those models look, they're not a faithful representation of what's happening. And you can see here the TNFR1 knockout in the macrophages is completely lost. So we know that all of this is due to TNF signaling, but trad is not important. Neither is RIP. I've just, you know, made a big point uh, making my little plasticine balls of ubiquitin and sticking them on RIP-K1. But it turns out that you can get by without having uh, RIP-1 at all. And this is work from uh, Lin Wong in the lab. And you can see here that whether we took uh, wild type, that whether we took primary or transformed macrophages, uh, that uh, they, they promote the degradation of IKB-alpha uh, the RIP knockouts promote a very good degradation of IKB alpha. P65 is supposed to translocate in the into the nucleus in response to TNF. And again, you can see that here, here we've got the wild type, 15 minutes of TNF, there goes P65 into the nucleus, there's the RIP1 knockout. And uh, we can see upregulation of, of transcripts, including IKB alpha, and they all look relatively normal. What about... TRAF2, this is work that, that Nima is going to present. Well, in the TRAF2 knockout, and, and here we, we have to make, because the TRAF2 knockout is lethal, we have to make a TRAF2 knockout in the skin. And you can see that there is the, this inflammatory phenotype in the TRAF2 knockout. Um, again, CIP knockouts are, are, are embryonic lethal, so we have to make a, a, a skin-specific knockout. And here you can see that the phenotype is much worse so, so this, again, although the, our models uh, lead us to believe that TRAD recruits TRAF2, which recruits CIPs, nevertheless, you can get, uh, you still get signaling in TRAF2 knockouts. Uh, it, it, you get the effect in a TRAF2 knockout, but in a CIP1 knockout, you get a more severe effect. So this tells us that somehow CIPs can... Uh, probably be recruited a little even in the in the absence of TRAF2. Uh, and you, again, you can see that this effect in the CIP skin knockouts is much more severe. And this is this uh, sharp in mouse that I, I showed you before. That where we, if we remove one one allele of TNF, uh, we we recover. And again, you can see that this has a, a, a skin phenotype. Uh, with this uh, keratinocyte uh, proliferation. And again, you can see that this is probably, uh, is, a, is, is definitely a lot less severe than CIP1. So there seems to be some merit in the model that IAPs can, can recruit LUBAC, and LUBAC is perhaps uh, less important than the IAPs. Uh, and again, we, we've shown uh, that uh, LUBAC, uh, this sharpen containing complex, is important for uh, TNF-induced NF-kappa B. I'm really... Uh, and it's also important for other uh, NF-kappa B responses. So I've done a little bit of sleight of hand here because I've just told you that, you know, the model seemed to make sense because I had TRAD and RIP and CIPs. But what I showed you, in actual fact, was that when we got rid of these components, we actually had an inflammatory disease. And yet, my models, and again, I put this up to make you uh, relax a little bit and enjoy the talk, but also to make the point that they are nothing but models, okay? It might as well be a radish as, as anything else. So, CIPs, uh, I've told you that if we delete these, we get an inflammatory disease. But how does that work? Because if, if what I've told you is true, and I love P65, I mean, that is just, I counted every single P there, by the way. <laughs> right, so P65 goes into the nucleus, generates inflammatory cytokine, but I showed you if we re remove these uh, factors, we actually get inflammatory disease. So this, uh, and this is exactly the mouse that I was telling you about, and so we've, have to think of a, an alternative hypothesis. What, what, what is going on in, in these mice? It, they apparently can produce less inflammatory cytokines in response to TNF, but the mouse has an inflammatory phenotype protected by loss of TNF. And the answer to this, we believe, 
is to do with the, the second pathway that is activated uh, in response to TNF, which is the death pathway. And I'd already mentioned how TNF has this sort of, sort of schizophrenic nature where it, it induces a, a cytokine response that, uh, it, that simultaneously induces a death response, which it actually inhibits by the production of this uh, protein C flip. And th if, if, C f if this pathway is reduced, we will, will not get C flip production and we might get apoptosis. I don't have time to go into uh, why we don't think apoptosis is driving the inflammation. Um, and I just quickly want to m mention that um, this evidence for this complex two uh, came from uh, Jörg Chop's lab. And again, beautiful, very, very simple experiments. He simply did an IP of the TNF receptor and showed that uh, caspase 8 and FAD were not present in that. And then he did an IP of the caspase 8 from, from TNF-stimulated cells and showed that, uh, that the TNF receptor was, was not associated with, with that. Um, I really wanted to discuss this, but I don't have time. Um, we don't think apoptosis is driving the disease. There is a second, a, a second cell death pathway initiated by TNF, and this is this necroptotic pathway. We think this might be the source of uh, the, the inflammation in these uh, mice that can no longer signal this pathway. And indeed, we can show that uh, sharp in knockout mice uh, have uh, die in response to uh, sharp in knockout cells die in response to TNF, and this is, can be inhibited by necroptosis inhibitors. I, again, I, I really don't have time to do this. I'm very sorry. Um, as I said, I wanted to make sure that we really understand that TNF is there to help us, to help protect us uh, against wounding and, and, and infections. Uh, one of the first indications that, that what, the strongest pieces of evidence that this is so is that viruses uh, carry many uh, components that are involved in inhibiting TNF signaling. And again, this link with etanercept is that uh, pox, vi pox viruses produce their own version of etanercept to, to soak up some of the TNF. They produce uh, fl viral flips that inhibit this TNF-induced caspase 8 uh, process. Uh, the, the viral flips are, again, identified by Jörg Chop. And uh, we, again, just to remind you of a, a wonderful talk from, from Liz Hartland where she showed how uh, bacteria also produce uh, uh, components that inhibit this TNF signaling pathway. Uh, and they're actually modifying uh, FAD, TRAD, this producing a protein, NLEB1, that modifies FAD, TRAD, and, and RIP1. And this was also data that, uh, or at least a part of the story that, that Liz Hartland presented, uh, just mentioned how an NLEB1 modifies FAD, TRAD, and RIP, but, but it also produces a, a second component. This is the, the enteropathogenic E. coli injecting these effector, these effector molecules into the cell to inhibit DNF signaling. And what uh, Liz and uh, our group has shown is that the e ESPL, another component, is involved in degrading uh, RIP1. And if you look at a lot of bacterial, um, the bacteria contain a number of these inhibitors uh, that are targeting elements of this signaling pathway. There's uh, the decoy receptors from the cowpox. Uh, the other bacteria are, are cleaving and getting rid of uh, TNF. And one of the things here that I want to, uh, again, emphasize is that you can see that even in the same bacteria, so EPEC, that it targets 
very, it, it targets different levels of the same pathway. And I think this will get to, to my point that, the T, uh, that one of my final points, which is that TNF signaling is very plastic and very uh, adaptable. And this bacteria is already telling us that it's not enough to inhibit one component. You actually have to inhibit several. Um, just last uh, slide uh, of data. Again, I want to say that um, loss of TNF, I've said, is a major inflammatory cytokine. It's there to help uh, us resist uh, bacteria. And yet, of course, we can get rid of TNF in, in mice, and they seem to run around perfectly uh, well. And if you remove another TNF superfamily ligand uh, called FAS, they succumb to a, a lymphoproliferative syndrome, and if you cross them to the TNF knockout, they don't get it. And again, it really, this little bit of snippet of data is emphasizing this dual role of TNF, that it, it, uh, it's there to protect us, but, but it also is actually, in many cases, driving diseases. And again, just to mention that I've told you that these anti-TNF drugs are wonderful, and they are, uh, but of course, uh, people on them do succumb uh, more readily to bacterial infections, and they are not recommended if you actually uh, suffer from uh, already uh, infections or even local infections, because getting rid of that TNF will uh, make you more susceptible. So here's my, my take-home messages. I'm sorry I've had to rush through a little bit. Never good at managing my time. TNF is a master regulator of inflammation, and the evidence is there from evolution. It's there from bacteria and viruses, the, our pathog the pathogens that are trying to block it and prevent, prevent it. And, and those meta the, the, the drugs demonstrate beyond doubt that it is a, a very powerful inflammatory cytokine. And it, you know, in some ways, in, in our systems, it's, it's the, 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 the models, are, the, the mice that I've shown you, it's actually, it's more dangerous to have too much than to have, to have none at all. Uh, now, I don't think that can really be true. It, it has to tell us that in, in the environment, uh, TNF is really powerful cytokine, and we still haven't quite understood exactly how important it is, because if it's that dangerous that having a little bit too much drives disease, then um, it's, uh, it's telling you how important a molecule it is to have. I think that it should be obvious that real master regulators have to have many different levels of, cr uh, of control. There were some of these papers that I didn't have time to discuss which claim essential roles for proteins. Uh, and I don't think that we can uh, justify that understanding. What I take home from these is that TNF is an extremely plastic signaling cassette, which is, can often push through the signaling even when uh, different components are affected. And I think that this will also be true in a, a cell type specific manner that certain proteins, certain responses will be important in certain cell types whereas other proteins will be less important in other cell types. And apparently I'm finished. <laughs> it's beeping at me. I, that is uh, really the, my take-home messages, and I think that, that, that that's really what I want to say. But there was a small slide for acknowledgements, but uh, it simply said uh, thanks to all my lab past and present and to funding in NHMRC. Thank you very much. That clock is right, isn't it? Now we have a few minutes, and yeah. I'm sure many of the students would like to ask There's a student at the back. Hey. <laughs> oh, are we good students? Claire, go on. Oh, okay. they're, they're warming up. So um, we often think about inflammation and cancer, and it's been quite a vexed story over the decades. Can you just comment a bit about chronicity? Perhaps of inflammation required to result in the infection, and how chronicity affects these models? So, so I think that the inflammation co comes after the, the crit critical events. I think the evidence from uh, viral from infections that lead to uh, tumorigenesis 
Uh, I think that they're all indicating that probably the initial insult is something that stimulates the inflammatory response and then the inflammatory response uh, does those things that which normally it should be doing, uh, promoting uh, cell growth and maybe angiogenesis if there's a wound. And I, so I think that inflammation is uh, how is it exactly as uh, Hannah Hannah Weinberg said in that review that it's an enabling characteristic? I don't believe that it's an original uh, driver. Although there is that evidence that you know, for some reason, cells that are, are being continuously stimulated do seem to be uh, acquiring more, more mutations. So it's just about possible. I can convince myself, like the rheumatoid arthritis and, and Crohn's disease, could you argue that there the inflammation is with the excessive cell growth is actually driving? I th again, I, I'm going to go both ways. <laughs> I think that it's, yeah, the, the inflammation could be a driver, but, but often it is more of an enabling characteristic. Um, John, uh, <coughs> some of these are Parent paradoxes um, that you described um, are obviously to do with a number of interacting events occurring simultaneously and in different directions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But imposed on that is the is the time factor and also the, the dose. So I'm just wondering if is the, the sorry, dose as well as the, the duration yeah. of signaling. Um, and so I, my question is: in the in vitro systems, are there um, are there dose-related differences if you look down the different pathways? Uh, you know, like if you put your finger on the door chime of the TNF receptor, is it a chime or is it a buzzer? I mean, and does it depend on how long you expose the, um, the pathway in terms of whether you get um, things going in different directions? Very sort of fundamental question, I guess. I think that, and again, I, I should have emphasized it more about how, in, but, but I did point out with the IKB alpha that uh, one of the first things that TNF does is, is shut itself down. So I, I think that it very much is, is that door time, and that's the way it should be. Uh, and, and, and when it's doing its job properly, it will be a door time, and then it will uh, turn off the signal, it will have recruited the inflammatory cells, and, and they will do their job. I think that you're absolutely right. In the, in the genetic models that we look at, we remove that um, control, and so what happens is that we are actually driving all all the time, and we're not allowing uh, the the system to to, sh to shut off properly. So um, now, in in real human diseases, that it's not as clear that they, you know they have such a or, or in, you know, common uh, human inflammatory diseases, it's not obvious that they have a mutation that is constantly allowed, constantly uh, pressing. Uh, but I think that you know, the will. There is some evidence that there are um, genetic predispositions in in these signaling pathways, and so I, th I think that 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 will probably uh, come out more that there is an underlying uh, genetic uh, lack of control o over the signaling pathway. Well, just to follow up on that, yep. I think it does pretty clear that those mutations don't increase signaling through the receptor. The current hypothesis is that it's uh, resulting in misfolding of the TNF receptor and that triggers... The trap swap. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, I was, uh, you know, that's been one that I've used a lot in the past and as I was presenting getting ready for this talk I felt no I'm not happy with that so and I was going to look it up so it's a uh, it's exactly what the paper said which was that you've got uh, a lack of clearance from from the plasma membrane yeah so it looks like it misfolds maybe inappropriate localizers to the ER triggers ROS production and that's why maybe they respond well to block edge of R1 yeah but but R1 would be a downstream Signaling from that receptor. Yeah, yeah they, 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 some patients respond very poorly to blockade at TNF and actually have 
vastly yeah, yeah, yeah. exacerbated because it's... Although it was, was dry. Yeah, it works for some fashion. No, but I'm saying that TNF would produce IL-1. Yeah. So I wasn't sure, just, just from what I could read, whether it, that, that receptor was actually more of it and, and, and signaling, still competent to signal. No, no, it's not. You don't, it, it don't. Okay, good, thank you. Question. If not, I'd like to thank John for a really engaging.